Okay, so now we have come to a, a, um, a fork in the road, ladies and gentlemen, and we must make a decision. Now at this point in the road, we have enough time to do one of two things, and either one of these two things we do, we will probably do it poorly and inadequately, but at least we'll make a reasonable go of doing it. Okay, now we can either continue with the sutta and talk about dependent origination and the 12 factors of dependent origination. All right? Or we could take a sideways look and focus on the, the teaching specific to the Kachayana Sutta and look at the comparative versions of the suttas and how that's handled differently in the different comparative suttas. Right? We don't have time to do both of those things. Which one would you like to do? Dependent origination? <laughs> Middle way is we... No, okay. So we do dependent origination? All right, okay, no worries. Thank you so much. Okay, so <coughs> now in the Kachayana Sutta itself, it's merely giving us a summary of dependent origination, as happens so often. And of course, one of the idioms of the suttas is that uh, the core teachings are taught many, many times. Uh, so that you know the, the the main things are repeated again and again, and uh, often that these are abbreviated in the texts. And just so you know, as you can see the Pali here, um, the, the the abbreviations are actually in the Pali text themselves. Okay, so when you read translations and the translations are abbreviated, it's not just an invention of the translator. It's actually the Pali text which is abbreviated. When we translate it, we don't always translate it exactly. So, sorry, we don't always abbreviate it exactly the same way that the underlying text does, right? Sometimes we might abbreviate things more. Sometimes we might explain it a bit more. But generally speaking, the abbreviations in the Pali are quite sensible, and so we usually follow those uh, unless there's a good reason not to. Okay. So, given that this is uh, an abbreviated form here, and, and you can see that, that this is abbreviated in all of the texts. So if we have a look at the Sanskrit, where's the Sanskrit version here? Um, uh, I'll just show you the actual Sanskrit text, root text. Sanskrit root text, where's it from? I'm just having trouble. From Topan. Sanskrit text from Topan. Uh, Sanskrit text here. And again, Yadatasming Sati Mangakaji. Okay, so the Sanskrit text says explicitly uh, that is to say, uh, when uh, the uh, when this arises, that arises. Uh, that is to say, when uh, ignorance, conditioned by ignorance, are sankharas, or choices, and then it says, or, right, until the or origin and suffering, uh, literally as before, up and up so far as till uh, it is the origin and suffering. Sorry, sorry, the, it is the origin and, end and ending. Yeah. So what is so this uh, it's 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 giving an, it's giving instructions for the abbreviation. It's giving the first few phrases of dependent origination. It's saying as before, i.e., as previously in the collection, uh, then give the origin of dependent origination and the cessation. Okay, so it's actually giving you an explanation in the text itself as to how to expand it. So my point here is simply that that the abbreviations are very often found in the text themselves. And because that's the case, I will refer to another text for the full sequence of dependent origination. Okay, and I'll look at the beginning of the uh, Nidana Sangyutta, and particularly at the second sutta in the Nidana Sangyutta, which is the analysis, the Vibhanga Sutta. And in the Vibhanga Sutta, uh, the first sutta just gives the straight uh, 12 links of dependent origination. The Vibhanga Sutta gives the 12 links with an explanation for each one of those terms. All right, so this is, this is getting our basics done. And again, just let me say that with dependent origination, 
It is a cliche to say dependent origination is deep and profound, to say that it's a difficult teaching. And it's uh, we can talk about the philosophical dimensions and uh, of dependent origination, but I think it's important before doing that to get a good grounding into what the actual terms mean. Because if we don't do that, we end up with lots of abstractions which uh, move further and further away from what the Buddha was intending. I'm not saying that it's wrong to do that. I'm just saying that we should be aware that when we're making abstractions, that that's what we're doing. If we're taking dependent origination and applying it in a new context, that's fine, but just be aware that that's what you're doing. But if we haven't really grounded our understanding into what the Buddha was actually saying, then we never really know to what extent that we're representing what is the Buddha said or what is an interpretation. So let's just go through these 12 factors and let's see, I'm going to test your knowledge of each of these 12 factors. All right, so briefly sum up the 12 uh, uh, conditions, 12 links. Ignorance is a condition for choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Name and form are conditions for the six sense fields. The six sense fields are conditions for contact. Contact is a condition for feeling. Feeling is a condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. All right? Okay? That's that so far. That's, that's why everything is so messed up, because of all of these things. Now, in my translation of this, I've translated some words a little bit differently from how previous translators have done it. That's my job. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd just be copying them. So if you have any questions about why this particular term is translated in the way it is, then please just ask. Yes? Good question, yes. Um, one of the hard things to translate, and I struggled with it, and I went back and forth many different times on that particular one. And um, I'm not at all sure that that's... I mean, I think it's a reasonable translation, but I may go back and change it again. <laughs> uh, but the idea here is that um, if we just mention existence, then I feel that... It, it becomes a little bit too general and a little bit too um, abstract. And what the, uh, the idea here is that it's talking, essentially it's talking about, about life, about the continuation of life, right? That cycle of life and continuing going. So it's not saying when it says that existence ceases, it doesn't mean that just like everything just around you just stops, right? So if you talk about the cessation of existence, yeah, it's, it, what does it just mean that that, that I beam is not there anymore. That's not that's not really what it means, right? So it means it's cessation of that continuation of that process. So I thought of things like say the process of existence might be another way of translating it. Or like like bhava can often be translated as life as well. Yeah? So like the ongoing cycle of life, something like that. So it's that idea to, that we're talking about a process rather than like a state of existence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 It's one of those things where you try to make the translation clear. At the same time, you know, I think one of the things as a translator is that we have to accept the limitations of what we're doing. Like you can't overload the words with too much meaning. You know, sometimes these things they 
you know, it takes a lot of discussion and reflection and so on, and you can't expect to capture every nuance of it in the translation. So my main aim was to say, look, can someone read this and basically get the idea? And <laughs> if they can do that, then I'm pretty happy. Okay, let's let's continue on, and let's have a look at this. So now we're going to define each one of these terms, and I'm going to ask you if you can tell me what these definitions are as we come to each of them. So the first one, what is old age and death? Who can tell me? Now how is it defined here? Yes, it is dukkha, but how is it actually defined here? It is a condition, but what, like, specifically, what is it? Decay? Rising and falling? Anybody else? Things wearing out? Dissolution? Cessation? Anyone else? Breakup? Okay, Und undermining of, of the ground of existence. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we have all of those suggestions. Let's see what the text says. You ready for the big reveal? <laughs> the old age, decrepitude, broken teeth, gray hair wrinkly skin, diminished vitality, and failing faculties of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. This is called old age. Pretty specific, right? Yeah, it's very vivid. Yeah? And as I'm, I'm, I'm you know, sitting here, I'm sort of feeling my own teeth, which are pretty broken. My hair is pretty grey. So, no. Okay. So, what about uh, death? So that's the definition of old age. What about the definition of death? Anyone want to s have, an, have an idea what that is? How that's defined? Breaking down of the body. Cessation of being. End of the life cycle? You say? Sorry? Very wrinkly skin? <laughs> All right? Okay. Old age. The passing away, perishing, disintegration, demise, mortality, death, decease, and breaking up of the aggregates and laying to rest of the corpse right, of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. Okay. Yeah. Well, so like uh, human beings is one. Yeah, kangaroos is another. Sorry. Dogs, dolphins, ghosts, devas. Right. Yeah, all the different orders of beings. Yeah. Right? I think so, yeah. So, well, it d again, it depends on the context because it's very vague. So, in, in some cases, this world can mean this, all the different orders of beings, but in other cases, it means like specifically this world, i.e., the human world. Yeah. So, it, it, d it, it, it have to look at it in context. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Well, what if, if you're a fish, for example, your corpse doesn't get laid to rest, it floats to the top of the water. Well, look, I, I, I guess it's, you know, it's a bit general, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, mm, 
uh, the Kiria. Yeah, no, um, doesn't. Uh, it, it actually almost does does mean that. Yeah, uh, the the Pali phrase here is Kalevara Satnikepo, where Kalevara is like a specific word for a corpse. Actually, Pali has a lot of words for a corpse. And nikepa is the putting down or casting off or discarding. Yeah? So, um, yeah, nikepa, almost like literally like lay, laying down of a corpse. Yeah. So it doesn't, sorry? Ah, tamhi, tamhi. Uh, yeah, so here we have ya te sang, te sang, satanang. So of those various kinds of sentient beings, te sang has a, when we repeat the pronoun in Pali, it usually has a distributive sense. So te sang, te sang, satana, of all of those different kinds of sentient beings, tamhi, tamhi, sata, nikaya. So it's sata, nikaya. Right? So the word nikaya is the same word as in like the, the, the four nikayas or the Theravada Nikaya, or something like that. It means like an order, or, or a, a group, or a, a classification. Yeah. So here, Sata Nikaya means the different orders of beings, the different uh, realms of beings. That definition there is wrong. Sata here doesn't mean the number seven. It means a sentient being. OK? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, look, I, I, absolutely. You know, and and obviously, if you're a a, a turtle, then your hair isn't going to go grey or whatever. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit. You know, it's a little bit general, you know, but it's mostly, you know, it's mo it's most it's given quite a vivid depiction of of uh, old age. You know, certainly mostly as it applies to humans, yeah. mostly in the human realm. Yes, venerable sir. Right. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, thank you. Yes. So uh, here I've translated one of the other words I've translated a little bit differently is that I translate jati as rebirth. And jati is often translated simply as birth. Um, but actually, that's not really, not actually that accurate of a translation. If Let's see what the dictionary says for birth. Birth is the emergence of a baby or other young from the body of its mother, the start of life as a physical separate being. But that's not really what jati means, is it? Yeah. To give to birth as a verb. Yeah. So this is this is the the uh, uh, the meaning of birth is is actually to to give birth. Beginning or coming into existence of something, but also that's that's not quite what jati means because that that, that would be like samudaya is the origin or something, whereas here jati is more specific. Actually, it means uh, jati in this case, or uh, in the suttas. Basically, in these kinds of contexts, it always means rebirth, yeah? and so it, ne it never means birth as in coming. The, the specific word for being born is vijati, is a separate word. And conception is either birth jati or sanjati. Right? It specifically is a word for conception. So Pali distinguishes those, whereas jati is always a word that's used for rebirth in the context of you know, being born in that cycle of rebirth. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so such is old age, such is death. This is called old age and death. So what's rebirth? What's jati? The rebirth, inception, conception, reincarnation, manifestation of the aggregates and acquisition of the sense fields of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. So again, these, these words are, are quite 
uh, s s synonymous, and so it's a little bit tricky to try to figure out uh, a series of synonyms for these in in English. So don't don't uh, <laughs> don't, don't 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 worry too much about the exact meaning of those different terms, but they're basically just similarities. The, the terms in Pali, jati, uh, sanjati, it literally means conception. Okanti again has a meaning of conception. Uh, abhinibhati, uh, rebirth again again having a meaning of conception. The kandhanang patu bhava is the uh, origination of. Um, the aggregates ayatananang pati labho. Oh, hang on, I just showed you some of the answers. I'm not supposed to be doing that. <sighs> ah, dear, that's bad. Okay, anyway, so this is that rebirth. Okay? Okay, so what is continued existence? What is bhava? So anybody who didn't cheat by reading when it was shown, can they tell us what bhava is? Sorry? Born over and over again? Karma? Okay. That which continues after death. Anyone else? Okay. Do you want to know the answer? <laughs> to know whether you were right or wrong, because that's what spiritual development is all about, right? <laughs> it's getting the answers right. Yeah. You know, these three states of existence, tayome bhava, existence in the sensual realm, existence in the realm of luminous form, and in the formless realm. There, are, These are the three, this is called continued existence. Okay, so the Buddha is pointing to, to these three realms of existence. The, the sensual realm is this one, as well as all the lower realms and the the, the kind of the mainstream heaven realms. So Rupa Bhava, which I've translated as the realm of luminous form, this is the uh, place you go to if you get some really nice jhanas, but you don't actually practice the Eightfold Path, you don't see the Dhamma, but you go and get reborn and you're like, wow, this is so nice. And you just bliss out for like, ages and ages and you'd never get bored and you're just blissing out and on and on and on and it's so great until finally you crash and you're what am i doing back here again and the formless realm is the realms of rebirth from realizing the formless attainments so the arupa uh, attainments so this is the three states of existence yes is there some sort of an entity? Is there? How would I know? What do I do? I look like an expert to you? <laughs> the whole. That's that's what dependent origination is explaining. That's the point of this whole teaching. Yeah? Pointing out that there is this process, but it's not talking about an entity that's undergoing the process. Yeah? When it rains, is there a God in the sky who tells it to rain? Well, that, that just ruined that example for me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you personally believe that there's a God in the sky who... Okay, good, that's easy. So, why does it rain? Right. Right. Right, exactly. And so that's a natural process, a process of cause and effect, and we can understand that through our understanding of physics. 
and the, the natural world without having to invoke a god. So dependent origination is exactly the same. So it's talking about how all of these things happen, but we don't have to talk about a person who's in there. There's no person who's saying, let's reign. It's just a process. So what's happening here and now is just a process. And what's happening here and that process has a certain continuation to it. Yeah? Consciousness can neither be created nor destroyed. Right? To adapt the laws of thermodynamics to Buddhism. Yeah? <laughs> consciousness, speci consciousness is specifically you know, ar arising and passing away and changing, but the stream of consciousness, yeah, the stream of conditions, it keeps going. Floating around. <laughs> well, well, okay. So, uh, let me ask you in in turn. Um, if you have, I'm just trying to think of a good example. Um, if you have to uh, go to the shop to buy something at a shopping centre. Do you go directly to the shop that you want and nowhere else, or do you go somewhere else on the way? Sometimes, right? It depends, yeah? And why? B maybe, maybe you like to go to get what you want because y you're in a hurry, or because you just want that one thing, yeah? But maybe you're with somebody who actually, oh, actually, look, I just want to check out this department and check out this store, and they want to spend a bit, a bit of time, yeah? So it depends. That's how consciousness is. It varies. Yeah? And so this is just driven by desire. right? If you, wh why do you go to one shop and somebody else will go shopping and they'll go to a dozen shops? Well, it's just because of desire. Because they want what they want to do. You want to go to one shop, so that's what you do. Somebody else wants to spend time wandering from shop to shop, so that's what they do. It's driven by desire. So the process of rebirth is just driven by desire in the same way. So it depends on the person. Some people maybe go straight to where they want to go. Others maybe hang around for ages. Who knows? You keep asking the same question, yeah? <laughs> right. Hmm. Yeah. Right, yeah. Consciousness. Yeah. Maybe. Could be. Could be. Shall we continue? We're only we're only like halfway through. Oh, is that? Sorry, go on. Go on. Rupa Bhava, the realm of form, the realm of fine material existence. Many different translations. Fine material existence. Realm of form. Yeah. The Rupa here is the shining light. That's what rupa means in rupa bhava. It's the shining light, the nimitta that you see in meditation, the radiance of the, of the meditation mind. Yes. Yes. We are here, yeah. For the most part, yeah, yeah. Tends to be, yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Except, of course, if you're a meditator, then you know maybe if you're a meditator and you get into some deep states of meditation, then you might be likely to attach yourself to those deep states of meditation. You say, "Oh, this is my true self," you know, and this is when you get reborn in the rupa bhava or a rupa bhava. Yeah. Okay.
Yes. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> right. Uh, not really, not in the suttas. All, all, all those different terms are later terms. Yeah, we, we, we'll come to that. We will come to that. Okay, shall we continue? Let us continue. What's next? What is grasping? Upadana. Okay, but what, how is it defining the udana here? Well, how, so upadana, how is it defined here? Thoughts and sort of reasons. No. <laughs> Inclination, sorry? Inclination to have something. No. Well, these are not, these are not, none of these are completely wrong, but they're not, they're not the, they're not the definition that's been given here. Sorry? Okay. Okay. Sorry? Faculties. We were, we, uh, yeah? Okay. Okay, identifying. So that's like clinging to the view of self. Yeah? Something like that. Strategies. Desire. Conceptual. Okay. So we've got lots. Eventually, we've got to get it right. I mean, this is like the this is like the million monkeys typing to get the Shakespeare. Okay. <laughs> That's later. Four kinds of grasping. Grasping at sensual pleasures. Right. Grasping at views. Grasping at precepts and observances, sila bata, and grasping at theories of a self. Okay, so we got about two and a half of those. Yeah. So notice some some interesting things about this list of the four kinds of grasping. Right. Again, it's very specific. So the Buddha, in giving these definitions, is quite specific and quite concrete. Grasping at sensual pleasures is uh, fairly fairly straightforward, and notice how that that correlates with the existence in the sensual realm, right? So there's a, there's a nice correlation there, right? Now, the, uh, our, our desire for pleasure, and our desire especially for pleasure through our senses, is a very basic desire. It's very uh, it's very uh, fundamental. To the nature of consciousness. I mean, you can you can think about it even, you know, not to mention even humans, but even animals, even like bacteria. You know, if they have a, a, a food, then they'll move towards it. If they have like a painful stimulus, they'll move away from it. Right. So it's something which is very very primal in in the kind of roots of consciousness. However, these other things are not so primal. Right. They're actually quite sophisticated things. Views. Right. We, in the Kachana Sutta, we talked about views yeah, and talked about theories of things. So when the Buddha is talking about views, it means things like theories about whether there's a self or not, theories about is the universe infinite or not infinite, yeah, and these kinds of things. These are these are the kinds of views or theories or ideas that people can have and which you can get attached to. And of course, you see these days people do get very much attached to their views, right? In the old days. They, people were attached to, you know, is the universe infinite or not? These days they're attached to, is an Android better than an iPhone? And they have their views about that and they <laughs> get very excited about these kinds of things, right? And so, so but a view or a concept is quite a, a sophisticated level of the mind, right? It's something that we have to learn as we grow up. When we're born, we don't really have views. But as we grow up, we learn language, we learn ideas, and we, we gradually learn how to have views about things. Right? Then we get attached to them. So it's quite sophisticated. Precepts and observances also is something which is quite sophisticated. 
A little baby doesn't have those things. But what this is talking about is about religious observances which a person will take. So you take a certain vow or a certain observance and you might say, look, I'm going to... Well, I think, I think actually we're in, we're in Lent right now. Is that right? Any Catholics in the room? No? Ex-Catholics? Yes, ex-Catholics. Very good. So we're now in Lent, right? And we take an observance. And where I, used, you know, where I was, grew up in the suburb of Atterdale in Perth, there's a lot of Italians in that area, so quite a lot of Catholics there. That means long lines at the fish and chip shop on a Friday night in Lent. Yeah, and <laughs> so you take the, the different kind of religious observances, and it, and so it's sila, which as you know, sila means uh, morality or precepts, and vata uh, is a religious vow or a religious observance, and so it might be like. Uh, fasting once a week on the oposata or any of these kinds of things that people take as religious vows. The important thing here is it's not saying that you shouldn't have these things. Okay, It's saying that when you attach to them, then that, that becomes part of dependent origination. The same thing with, with sensual pleasures. The Buddha's not saying that you shouldn't ever eat nice food or see something beautiful. He's saying that this is a source for attachment. The same thing with views. We, we need to have views. right? You can't just not have any opinions about things. This is something which I think is a big fallacy among uh, some kinds of modern Buddhists. That they think, oh, I, I don't have any views about that, as if that's some kind of uh, spiritual attainment. Actually, it's just intellectual laziness. Right? If, you don't, you ha if you're saying that I don't have views about it, you absolutely do have views about it, right? <laughs> but you're being dishonest with yourself and you're being avoidant in your relationships with others. Right? Admit your views. This is my view about it. Fine, that's a starting point. Accept the fact that you have a view about it. Then we can talk about it. So views, precepts and observances and lastly, theories of a self. So this is a specific kind of view, specifically theories about what myself is. And we've already talked about different kinds of theories of a self. Uh, and of course, there are many different kinds of theories like that. So the kinds of grasping, yes, it has a general meaning of desire, attachment, and all of those kinds of things. But in the context of dependent origination, it's used specifically in a more advanced, sophisticated level of the mind, something that we only learn to do when we grow up. Right? This isn't something that, that a baby has, at least not fully. Right? It's something that we learn to do as we grow up. And this is why a... A, in Buddhism, it's often believed or often said that, that karma is something that's created in the human realm. Right? Animals don't really make karma. I mean, they, but they probably do a little bit to some degree, right? But if you're, if you're you know, reborn as a crocodile and you go and kill things, right? I mean, you're not making bad karma because you're killing things. You're a predator. That's what you do, yeah? Animals, of course, still can make karma, and if you've known pets or something like that, you know that they can be kind, they can be considerate, they can be naughty, and all of these kinds of things. Yeah, so there is some some sort of intentionality there, but because there's there's not that kind of higher order level of of views and so on, this is what tends to focus the direction of your choices. It's not just driven on a whim from from moment to moment, but it's focused over a long time, so you can make deliberate choices within that framework. And that's what, that's what gives the power and the strength to your karma. So this is why in Buddhism, generally speaking, most of the karma that we make is made within the human realm and not so much in the other realms. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. What do you mean? Yeah. So a baby doesn't make a bad karma, right? If the baby poos its pants, it doesn't make bad karma. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you gradually learn to do that. I mean, it's just it's just ordinary... Common sense, right? I mean, we don't hold babies responsible for their actions, yeah, and we, because we understand that they're not really capable of of those kinds of things, they gradually learn that as they grow up. 
All right? So move on. Grasping. Next one. What is craving? Anybody want to tell me what craving is? You can use the word craving, that's fine. No. Okay, fair enough. Oh, yeah. And you still can't let go of them, right? Yeah, yeah. So craving to get rid of things? From what? Habit. Well, I guess, I guess habit would come more under like ignorance. Like if you're just doing something out of habit without thinking about it, and there's like an unknowing there. Whereas, whereas craving to get rid of something is more of a kind of negativity, more hate. Yeah. So, 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 yes. Like a thirst. Well, that's almost like a literal thing. Like the word tanha actually literally means thirst. Yeah. When I was in, we were traveling, we were, going, we were in Delhi, we were staying in the hotel, and the bar there was called the Trishna bar, the thirst bar, i.e. craving. It was very, uh, very appropriate. There are these six c classes of craving. Craving for sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, and thoughts. Okay? So here the Buddha is bringing the focus to the sixth sense experience. And notice how this craving is quite differently phrased than the grasping is. Okay? Again, on a, on a general sense, craving and grasping are more or less synonyms. Right? But specifically as they're described in dependent origination, they're quite different. Craving is much more primal. Right? Everyone has these things. Right? A dog has craving for sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Yeah? A baby does. Anyone has that. This is a very basic function of the mind, a, 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 like a, an, an intuitive or innate instinctual desires of the mind. Right? Whereas the grasping is more conceptual, more intellectual, more developed. All right. So this is really the distinction between craving and grasping in dependent origination. So it's an imp important distinction to bear in mind. Come back to that idea that dependent origination is talking about that cycle of life. It's talking about that process by which we grow and and die. Yeah. And so that physical process is actually includes a, a theory of childhood development. Right? This is part of dependent origination, and that's explicitly mentioned a number of places in the suttas when it talks about, you know, when a child, when a baby is young and it's playing with the toys and these kinds of things. So the idea of childhood development is explicitly a part of dependent origination. Yes. Other rupa rupa. So this rupa, yeah. Ru so rupa has a number of different meanings, but the two main meanings it has is in this context sights, right? And otherwise it can mean any kind of material form, so anything in the material realm. So in this context it means sights. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touches and thoughts. Actually under that last one, the dhamma, dhamma tanha doesn't quite mean thoughts, but a more accurate translation would be mental phenomena. But mental phenomena is just too clumsy. I couldn't bring myself to use it. So that's a bit more of a... Uh, colloquial translation there. Ah. Uh huh. Ah. Right. Well, it's not craving, right? I know. Yeah, craven. Diff different words. Yeah. What? But yeah, and I think I think that that that, that kind of cra cra that kind of craven act is again is coming from a very I think very primal kind of fear, right? 
And uh, so, yeah, it would be included under the craving here because it's, kind of because it's some kind of fear to avoid damage or to avoid harm or something like that. Yeah. Or to inflict it. But, but you want to inflict it because you want to avoid it for yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay, let's move on. We're running a little bit out of time. What's feeling? Like, dislike, and dunno. Not too bad, except no. Feeling born of contact through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So normally when feeling is defined in the suttas, it's the three kinds of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feeling. Uh, actually, independent origination does talk about that in some cases, but normally it's talking about it with the six senses. Uh, and as we'll see as we go further, that the pattern of the six senses is actually going through uh, many of these factors. Okay. Uh, so continue, it's feeling. What is contact? Perception, eye contact, eye contact, so contact through the six senses, yeah? Contact is a little bit different from perception. Well, um, so contact means something like stimulus. So the Buddha always said, tiyanang sangati paso, the coming together, the eye, the form, the eye, the sight, and the eye consciousness. And the coming together of the three is contact. Yeah? So it's like, it's like that, m that, that moment or that, that uh, event when your inner consciousness is becoming aware of something outside. Okay, it can happen purely in the mind as well, but, but the basic idea is, is that, that the, different, the different factors that are giving rise to awareness are all coming together. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so, no. It's the same consciousness. Yeah. 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 Yep. But that one I think comes up later as well, yeah. Uh, yes, fe feeling, uh, good question, thank you. Feeling is more um, elemental, right? So it's just, the, it's just the, the tone of experience. So, for example, you have unpleasant feeling, but unpleasant, unpleasant feeling can, of course, be associated with a wide range of emotions. So emotions are a more complex uh, manifestation of feelings and perceptions and thoughts and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So six classes of contact. Oh, here I am revealing all these answers again. So six classes of contact again: eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. That's uh, and the six sense fields again. That's too easy, right? You know the answer to that. I, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind again. So it's that pattern of that sixth sense experience which is coming through. So again, this is that. This is the Buddha was always teaching that our sense experience was unfolding due to um, due to a, a process, a natural process. And again, this 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 contrasts with the theory of senses in the Upanishads that preceded the Buddha, where these uh, sense experiences were felt to be entities unto themselves, right? So Brahma actually created these things which were entities, and so they, they entered a person and they gave them the ability to do this, to, to have that sense experience. So six sense fields, next one is what is what a name and form, Nama Rupa. Who can tell me that? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, everyone got that? Okay, so name or nama is feeling, which we've already had above. Perception, sanya, intention, jetana, paso, contact, and attention or manasikara. Okay, so these are five 
very important mental qualities which are, according to the later Buddhist Abhidhamma theory, are always present in the mind. All right? So this is called name. And the form is the four primary elements, earth, water, wind, and fire, and form which is derived from the four primary elements. And when it talks about the form derived from the four primary elements, essentially uh, it means uh, things like, say, structure, yeah, space, right? How that form is kind of organized in kind of higher levels and different aspects of it. So anything which is which is derived from those four elements is regarded as the the derivative form, upadaya rupa. Okay. So just it's very important to get exactly what's being meant here by name and form, nama rupa. Nama rupa is one of, is a very hard term to translate well, and Many people have tried, and we keep for coming back to this kind of name and form. It's not particularly good, but it's kind of handy and no worse than other ones. Um, <laughs> uh, but in this particular context, right, what's been talked about by uh, as name or nama is particular functions and processes of the mind. All right? Yeah, particular things that the mind does, how the mind works, right? Through feeling, through experiencing things, through intentions, and so on and so forth. And these are the things that kind of make your mind work, right? Without any of these things, it's hard to know what the mind would be. But what it's missing here is awareness, or consciousness, and that's the next factor. So it's basically everything in your mind that you can know all of your thoughts and feelings and moods and all of these things, but not the awareness itself, which we're going to be coming to in a minute. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, don't, don't, don't worry about that too much. There's, it's not like a strictly linear thing. So the same factor often appears, actually. If you look closely at it, you can see the same factor appears at multiple times. So, yeah. These things are kind of organic and messy, right? So you describe it in terms of a linear process, but the reality is it's a lot more... Yeah, a lot more fuzzy than that. So you can go and, and look at the different relations and things, but, yeah, no, basically it's talking about the same thing. Okay? Such as name, this is name and form. So what is consciousness? Again, the six classes of consciousness. So there's no separate or different consciousness. It's just eye, uh, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousness. Okay? That's correct. Uh, it doesn't say what consciousness is. It just says that there are six types. Yeah. But one of the things that it does is it says what consciousness isn't, right? So it says what consciousness. It, it says that, that, that there is no consciousness that isn't these six types, right? And this, and of course, this again is directly opposing the Upanishadic view once more. The Upanishadic view is that there is an infinite consciousness, which happens when all of these things have ceased. Yeah, then the Upanishads say that that the name and form is like like each river has its name and its shape. And when each river flows to the sea, they all lose their name and their shape, and they just become known as the great ocean. And that ocean is the consciousness. Right? That's the Upanishadic view. So the Buddha said, no, that's not the case. Right? Actually, when we look at consciousness, there's no ocean of consciousness that's eternal and absolute and permanent. It's just these six sense consciousnesses. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a kind of mind consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. So, so something like a, you know infinite consciousness and things like that. These are these are uh, states of mind which we can develop through meditation, but it's not like the essence of what consciousness is. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. It's five fifty nine. We're almost finished, and we've almost learned everything there is to know about dependent origination. Whoa. We're pretty good. I reckon we're pretty good. Three kinds of so sankara. 
So I've rather controversially translated Sankara as choices here, translated previously as, uh, what is it, uh, volitional formations, karma formations, volitions, uh, what other ones do we have? Uh, fabrications, confections, concoctions. Um, oh my goodness. And you know, we have lovely phrases in translations that will say he, he generates a demeritorious volitional formation. I'm sorry, generates a demeritorious volitional formation, which I translated that he, he makes a bad choice. Which I don't know about you, but it makes a little bit more sense for me. So the, the point about sankharas here, three kinds of sankhara, uh, they're the choices by way of body, speech, and mind. So here it's not giving you too much detail, but elsewhere when it talks about sankhara, independent origination, it talks about punyabhi sankhara, apunyabhi sankhara, and nenjabhi sankhara. There's the choices, uh, good choices, bad choices, and anenja means imperturbable. It's the intentions which arise out of deep meditation. So these... Um, choices, sankhara, have an ethical quality. They have a moral quality, right? And in English, when we talk about that, when we talk about doing moral things, usually what we say is you made a choice. We say, why did you end up in that situation? Well, I made some bad choices, right? That's the normal English. You, you might use the word intention in a moral sense, but we usually don't use words like volition in a moral sense. It's more of a technical term. So typically when we're talking about those kinds of those kinds of moral decisions that make you end up in a certain kind of place, the usual word we use in English is choice. So this is what sankharas are. They're some kind of morally relevant or morally powerful choice that end you up in a certain place. That's the whole point of them. Okay, yeah. That's that's correct, yeah. That's, so this is another meaning of it. So actually in the suttas, most of the time it has this meaning. So most of the time it means choices, but occasionally it has a more general meaning where it means any kind of conditioned thing. Yeah. Ah, uh, pretty much they mean the same thing. Yeah. Mano and Chitta. Man, Mano and Chitta are, are, are explicitly said in the suttas to mean the same thing in the Nidana Sangyutta. Yang, um, what, is, what is Mano, what is Chitta, what is Vinyana, um, what does it say? Uh, oh, I can't remember. Anyway, basically it, has, it means the same thing. Oh, it's just a, diff just a slightly different phrasing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So just wrap up very quickly uh, because we're over time already. So what's ignorance? Not knowing about suffering, not knowing about the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. So ignorance is defined specifically in terms of the four noble truths. So this is the uh, origination of this whole mass of suffering. And then, of course, uh, the negation of everything is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering as well. So this is the basic explanation of the 12 factors of dependent origination. This has not got us very far in our understanding of dependent origination, but at least it's a start. Yeah? <laughs> so that's not too bad. Uh, I reckon if you, if, you, if you come to the next two classes in this course, you got a better chance of being enlightened than if you didn't come to the two classes. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay, so we really should rack up. Uh, we really should uh, stop. I'm, I'm cognizant of the volunteers who are here looking after things, and also many people have to go home. It's a Sunday night, so we should stop here, much as I would like to continue for the rest of the night talking about dependent origination. So thank you all so much for your attendance. Thank you so much for your uh, for being here and for making me not look stupid because I would feel very stupid being here by myself. And 
uh, I look forward to seeing, I'll see some of you uh, at Uluru for a ret meditation retreat over Easter break. And those of you who I don't see at Uluru, I will see hopefully back here soon. <laughs> okay, for the next class.